First things first, if you're sitting at the back, please move forward. <laughs> There's nothing worse than having to shout to make it all the way to the end of this very, very long, long and skinny room. Way different than it used to be in Ruston. So I'm going to pass around before we do anything some handouts and also some business cards. If you want a digital copy of this handout, it's on Google Drive and I can send it to you. Just grab a card and um, send me an email with your email and I'll share that with you. And also if there aren't enough handouts, I don't think there should be. So first off, I'm going to start our, our meeting here by telling what I say to my students at the beginning of class, which is welcome to my classroom. And I hope you are all super excited to learn with me today because I'm excited to teach you. So first things first, who even am I and why am I up here talking to you? So my name is Caitlin Kaiser. Um, I'm a DMA student at Shenandoah Conservatory with Jonathan Snowden. I'm nearing the end of my program, hopefully eventually I'll be Dr. Kaiser and you know, be done with all of that dissertation madness and all of those things. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit outside of those things as to what I did before I started teaching online because I think that's important to know because I suspect a lot of you will relate to those things. And also why I started teaching online because that's part of my story and it's really important for me to kind of share that information with you. So prior to teaching online, like most of us in this room probably, I taught a lot of private flute students. I had a studio in my home and taught from there. Um, I worked with several different middle schools and taught students through there. I did some group flute classes with those middle schools. I had an absurd number of those kids, um, like you know, group classes of like 12 middle school through this, which is a lot, as anybody who teaches middle school knows. Um, <laughs> and then I also, towards the end of all of that stuff, started teaching some classes to the local homeschool community, who were really hoping to find a way to kind of get an elementary music type of thing for their kids, because otherwise they just don't have access to that. And if parents aren't able to teach music, which a lot of parents aren't, then their kids kind of just have a big lack in their elementary education, um, especially in Winchester, where I was living. So all of that was going on. Things were going pretty well there. I decided to move to Harrisonburg, Virginia, to be with my partner. And I moved down there without a job at all. I quit my job um, and decided that I was just going for it. And I was just going to make it work. And it would be totally fine. <laughs> and it was like the craziest like, you know, midlife crisis of my life quarter life crisis. I was 26, so <laughs> not quite midlife, hopefully. Um, but so I just thought, yeah, I'm just going to go do it. And so I did it, and it was great. And two weeks after I moved into our townhouse, I was invited to interview for a company called VFD Kid, which is an ESL um, program. They, we teach students in China. So that was my first foray into online teaching. And I thought, wow, this is going to be so cool. I get to teach from my house in my pajamas. The hours are awful because it's in China. So I would start teaching at like 5 AM. Um, but you know, this is cool. So I did that for a while. And I'm telling you that not because I'm going to sell you on teaching ESL online, because if you can afford not to, don't. It's really early. We have to get up super early. And uh, it's just a whole situation. But all of those experiences gave me a lot of insight into what I wanted to do later when I started teaching music online. It taught me so many lessons in patience and in flexibility and in being able to sit in, in front of a computer and talk to people that are like this tall on the screen. It was a completely different experience for me. So things were going well with VIP Kid. I was even applying for some local jobs for some other types of things. And then I got sick. Um, really, really sick, and I have several different chronic illnesses that all flared up at the same time. I meant that I couldn't play flute anymore, um, was kind of the big, the big bad one there. So obviously teaching private flute lessons at that point for me was not going to work. Um, and I still wanted to teach music after I kind of came out of this big flare up and started coming back, you know, and wanting to do music things again, and I thought, well, I could teach homeschool kids. So I kind of started looking for that, but it's so hard to get into those communities, especially if you're not already in it. Um, that's the kind of environment that if you have a child that you're homeschooling, it's really easy to kind of break into the homeschool community. But if you don't, it's challenging. It's hard to find those people. So um, I was researching, I think, over the summer, probably maybe like July or so, and I came across a platform called OutSchool. And OutSchool is an amazing platform, and it's a platform that connects teachers with students, basically. You can teach almost anything on OutSchool. And when I first joined, at least in July, there were hardly any teachers who taught group music classes. Most of the music teachers who were on this program were teaching private lessons, which is also super awesome and super great, but obviously, as I was having issues playing, not something I wanted to get into. So all of that to say, if I sit down at any point during this, don't be alarmed. <laughs> it might happen. So let's talk about 
Well, first, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the hows. How do you teach online? What kind of equipment do you need? Because I think when I tell people I teach online, that's their first question. Like, what do you need for that? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to tell you about some of my classes and how I structure them and what kinds of things people want to even take in an online format because it's a little different than teaching in person. I'm also going to share some of the kind of pitfalls or challenges that you encounter because there are so many of them when you first start teaching online and it can be really, really stressful. Even if you're just teaching private students, there's a lot of kind of things you have to think about. And then I'm going to tell you some of my favorite stories about my kids because why wouldn't I? I want to share some exciting things. And I'll have time at the end for questions, but if at any point you feel you have a question, just pop your hand up and I'll go ahead and answer it. So first things first, how do you even teach online? When I tell people I teach online, usually they're like, what do you mean? Do you teach online? Do you make like YouTube videos and you post oh. them? And sometimes, yes, that is an option, but more often than not, I'm teaching live. So I'm teaching students as they're sitting in their own <laughs> homes attached to a computer or an iPad or whatever. Obviously, because of that, there are some tech requirements that I'm going to share with you. So the biggest one, of course, is an internet connection. You need strong and stable internet. I usually use a, an Ethernet cable, which is connected directly to my router. That's the way to avoid any kind of Wi-Fi mishaps that might happen. But you need to be prepared if you're teaching online for those internet issues to occur. They're going to happen. One day you're going to log in to teach your private flute student who you love and adore, and their internet's not going to be working, or your internet's not going to be working. So all of the important things that you can ever take away from this type of class is you always have to have a backup and you always have to be flexible. So I have an iPad that I use as my backup. I also have a hotspot on my phone. Highly recommend both of those things. The second thing is your kids are going to be looking at you. And when you're only this tall, it's pretty important for the quality of your picture to be pretty good. Because otherwise, <laughs> you're going to just completely lose them. They're going to be like, you know, mom's going to be vacuuming in the background. And they're going to be distracted. And they're going to walk away and go to the bathroom and get a drink and all of those things. So it's really important to kind of, it needs to be like you're there. So a high quality webcam. Big, big must for your big tech requirements there. Most of us, most teachers who teach online have external webcams because generally the webcam equipped with your, on your computer, your MacBook, something like that, isn't actually that good. And you'll get a lot of graininess. And also there's an issue of lighting a lot of times when you're teaching. And when you have an external webcam, you can adjust the lighting externally. So you can go into your webcam settings and slide around and do all of those things. Lighting, yes, just said that. And then audio equipment is definitely the biggest thing to consider, especially if you're teaching private lessons. If you're teaching private lessons, it's so important to be able to accurately portray things like color and dynamics. And you're not going to get that if you don't have a good quality um, microphone. So when I'm teaching just my group classes and that type of thing, I just have a headset with a mic on it. I've given you also a link somewhere on here. Maybe? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so that Amazon list has just tons of different options that are available to you as far as equipment that I use that isn't terribly expensive. But if you're teaching privately, most of the teachers I've talked to use external microphones. So they have like snowball mics or something like that that plugs in usually via USB, and that's what they're using, usually with a boom cover on it. If you're teaching flute especially, you need a boom cover or it's just going to sound like spit. It's not going to be a good sound. Um, so that's definitely like one of those big things that you have to consider. And if this is something you're going to be doing full time, or maybe you have a really huge studio and you're looking for a way to work around like snow days, something like that, definitely get a good quality mic up front. Just spend the money. You know, it's so hard to spend that money, but it's important, I think. Another thing to consider if you're sharing materials with your students, regardless if it's a multi-student classroom or if you're just on a one-on-one -on -one thing with your students privately, is you need to have some way to share that material. You need to be able to share printouts and handouts and all of the things that you would be giving your private students in person or that you would be giving your classroom of students. So I personally use Google Drive for that. Google Drive is free. I pay a slight upgrade, but I also have Google Fi, so it's included in there for a slightly larger amount of storage on Google Drive. Um, but as long as you're not uploading things like videos or MP3s, that type of thing, you don't need any kind of upgraded service for Google Drive. A lot of other teachers use Dropbox, so that's another thing to consider. Any type of cloud service like that that's going to be easy for your students to access, and more importantly, if you're teaching little ones, easy for their parents to access, <laughs> um, is really important. Yeah, that's one of the other caveats. It's just like private teaching in person. You have to really think about mom and dad being able to kind of manage all of these things in their home. And sometimes you're going to have mom and dad who don't know what they're doing. So we have to help them. So using something simple like Google Drive or Dropbox, big thing. Now that I've gotten all of those boring things out of the way, 
Let's talk about how you even develop the classes. So like I said at the very beginning, I don't typically teach private flute students online because at the moment I can't play the flute. It'd be hard to teach private flute students. However, I've talked to several of my colleagues who do teach private lessons specifically on OutSchool on that platform. Um, and they say that the way that they kind of develop things is just how you would do it in an in-person lesson. So they come up with goals for their students, come up with a plan with their students, kind of map things out for a certain number of weeks, maybe a month-long goal or three months or until solo and ensemble or however you typically do it in your uh, private studio. And that's how they make their kind of plans for their students. I'm slightly different because I'm teaching group classes and because specifically I'm teaching group classes in really kind of niche topics. Niche topics are important if you're teaching online, especially if you're on a platform like OutSchool, the platform I mentioned earlier. Let me tell you a little bit about what OutSchool even is. So it's essentially an Etsy of education. You log in there, that's the only good way to describe it. Um, so you log in there, you sign your kiddo up to take some classes and say they're 15 years old. You put that they're 15 in and then you can search any topic or you can just browse all of the classes and you're gonna see tons and tons of listings pop up. So because of that, it's important to have topics that are going to really gain a parent or a student's attention, like immediately. So if I list a class, for example, that just says nine week elementary music seminar, no one's gonna take it, nobody's gonna care. You know, Unless they're really, really interested in that specific topic, they're probably not gonna find it. So it's important to kind of teach our musical concepts through different topics. So for example, I have an animals and music class. And what we're learning are musical, musical listening skills. We're learning things like musical beat, tempo, dynamics, timbre, all of these simple concepts that we would be teaching to our students in private lessons, we're learning in a group class and we're centering those around um, pieces that involve animals because what kid doesn't like animals, you know? Um, and you know, you have to really like figure out what you want to teach. That's kind of the big, big opening thing. If you're not just teaching private lessons, figure out what you want to teach. So for me, I knew I wanted to teach things like music history. I knew I wanted to teach some music listening skills. Um, I'm personally a big fan of Broadway, so I thought, well, that'd be a fun class to teach, teach some Broadway, and I love film music, so I thought, film music class, that'll be great. You also have to consider when you're doing all of these things, what you would teach for free. That's the big question that we always ask kind of our people. We, there's a group that I'm a part of, there's a lot of different groups I'm a part of for online teachers, but that's the thing that we always ask when people are figuring out what classes to teach. What would you teach for absolutely no money in the entire world? And that's the topic you want to start with because otherwise you're going to feel like you're wasting your time just setting up all of these materials and getting ready and thinking, what if nobody ever takes this class? And all of those things, and you don't want that. And you want to be excited because when you're excited about teaching, your kids are going to be excited, just like in private flute lessons. Um, yeah, so but some of those topics that I already mentioned are kind of the ones that a lot of us find helpful. Private flute lessons are also helpful. Definitely. There's a huge, huge platform for that. And there are so many different ways to teach those private lessons. A lot of people use Zoom to teach private lessons. That's kind of the industry standard right now instead of uh, Skype, which was kind of the big one probably two or three years ago. Zoom has a screen sharing capability that's really, really easy to use. It's easy to get group classes through there. You can record your meeting and then send that clip to mom or dad or even to your students so they have access to it later. All in all, Zoom, I think, is just where, if you're gonna do private lessons, that's where I would start. I would definitely start with Zoom over Skype or FaceTime or any of those other platforms. They have a lot more issues, all in all. Another way to figure out if you want to teach group classes specifically are you need to look at your platform, take a scroll through there, figure out you know what's being listed on there, and look if there are any holes in those listings. You know, Remember, especially, think of it like, again, if you're on Etsy, if you go into the search bar and you type amethyst ring, you're gonna get a thousand results of all of these beautiful rings and you don't know who is a good you know, ring maker or which ring is the prettiest or whatever. Um, so it's easier for you ultimately to kind of have some unique topics that are being shared there. I think that's probably another big way to kind of get started in online teaching. Another thing to consider is what do you like in music? We all like different things in music. You know, in undergrad, um, I was really big into jazz, for example. So I like jazz, it would make sense for me to teach about jazz. It doesn't necessarily um, work well to just teach the classes that you think people will take, unless you're also interested in them, because you're just going to be miserable. I, I did it, I know. Um, I taught a musical listening through Minecraft class, which was big, 
people loved it because all of the kids, they're all into Minecraft right now, but I was so exhausted every week. And especially when you're teaching from home, it's easy to just not want to get out of bed or not want to go up to your office or whatever to teach those classes because you have other things that you could be doing. It's not like if you're in a brick and mortar school where you just go in every day and you're just in there already. You have a whole other element to deal with, which we're going to talk about shortly. Another thing to think about um, is what ages you want to teach or more importantly, maybe what ages you don't want to teach. So most of the platforms, things like OutSchool or Udemy, which I haven't even gotten to yet, they typically break their classes up into kind of a five-year range of ages, or sometimes a slightly shorter range. That's because typically a 15-year-old isn't going to want to take class with a seven-year-old. You're in completely different like cognitive levels there. And it's important for your students to feel comfortable with each other, especially in a group class. You want them to all feel like they're in class together, just like you would in a regular studio situation. So I think I've given you as well some of these age groups that they generally kind of break things into. You see a lot of four to seven. Typically the youngest age you're going to see on these platforms is three. I don't get many three-year-olds and every time I do, I'm internally panicked. Um, but four to seven is a pretty good beginning range. And then we kind of have like a middle school type of age. We have eight through 12, so upper elementary through middle school. And then generally teens all go together. So 13 through 18. If you're teaching, especially on a platform like OutSchool, where parents have the ability to message you and talk to you beforehand, you're probably going to encounter what we would call neurodiverse students. Um, pro approximately 50 to 60 percent of the students I teach follow or fall somewhere on the giant spectrum of neurodiversity. So <coughs> neurodiverse just means that they're not neurotypical. They're not following at the kind of standards for neurological development. So either they're incredibly gifted or they're lacking somewhere. They're behind in some way, shape, or form. Those are typically the students you're going to be seeing on these specific platforms if you choose to go with them because there's a reason generally that they're homeschooled or unschooled. If you're taking a class at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, chances are good that they're not in a typical public school environment. On the contrary, I teach some classes in the evenings to students who are public schooled, but they're very, very intelligent. So their parents are trying to kind of push them beyond the bounds of just the regular school environment and giving them some kind of extracurricular activities to complete in the evenings. I would say getting adjusted to that and kind of understanding that and knowing what to go into class with in that situation is one of the biggest challenges because you don't always know ahead of time. Sometimes parents will reach out and tell me, I had a parent reach out last week and explain that she had a, a student who fell within the age range of the class I was offering my animals a music class, actually, um, but that he was severely handicapped and couldn't necessarily color or write, and that typically she would help him in classes and she would just sit to the side. And, you know, they didn't even, she told me, we don't even have to turn the camera on. And I thought, that's so sad that you feel like you can't just show your student on camera. Um, you know, and so we have parents like that who are super, super outright about all of the issues or difficulties that their students face. And then we have some who they just want their kids to feel normal. And feeling normal means they don't tell the teacher what it is. It's not like in a brick and mortar school where you're involved in the IEP. Mm -hmm. You're probably not if it's online because they don't have to be involved in that. It's very different, very different setup than a brick and mortar school. So that's something to really consider is how are you going to adapt classes to that? Um, you know, when I was asked to do this presentation, Troy reached out to me very, very kindly. It was a hilarious email, actually, and said, I have great news. We want you to present. There was a slot that opened up, and we want you to present. And I thought, awesome. And they said, there's a caveat. There's no techno technology in the room. There's no projectors. There's no slides, you know, all of that. And at first, well, of course, I said, yes, of course, I'll do it. Um, and at first, I was like, oh, how am I going to accommodate my my visual learners, my people who need to see a screen over here with the outline, and how am I going to stay on track if I don't have an outline, you know? Um, but it's flexibility is so important when you're a teacher anyway, regardless of what you're teaching. Flexibility is number one for private students and otherwise. And flexibility online is huge because the environment is so, so different from what we're kind of used to typically. So because of those things, it's important to pick some <laughs> topics that are going to be fun, not only for you, but for your students. Like I always say, you know, when you're teaching online, you are this big. This is you, your whole self, especially if they're on an iPad. If they're on a cell phone, which they're allowed to take classes on cell phone, you're even smaller. They might not even be able to see who you are, you know. 
Um, and sometimes they don't, because sometimes they're running amok around their classroom. So the best thing to do is to pick topics that are interesting, something you can teach for free, and something that your kids are going to want to sit there and listen to for 50 minutes. Also keeping in mind that some of your kids aren't going to sit there and listen, and that's okay. They might absorb through osmosis. Maybe they'll go back and watch the video later. They might never want to ever look at your things ever again, and that is completely okay because your job is to teach them, and your job is to do the best you can for every kid who walks into your classroom, and some days that means that the best you do is Tommy running around the room frantically with his iPad, and you have to turn his camera off because it's making you want to vomit. <laughs> That's just how it is when you're teaching, especially online. Your kids are often going to be in their house, sometimes with unschoolers especially. They, I get to see all over the world with these kids. You know, I've had kids in the UK, I've had kids in Qatar, I've had kids um, in South America. And so sometimes they're sitting outside taking class, or sometimes they love learning so much and they love your class so much and they're looking forward to it so much that mom and dad were at shopping at Walmart and they sent Tommy out to the car so he could take class with you from the cell phone. Um, so, you know, you just you have to be really flexible. I think that's what I'm trying to bring out there. It's just flexibility. The other important thing are the materials that you provide. So I've brought some <coughs> of my materials to show to you. You can just pass those around and take a, just take a gander. A lot of the materials you provide depend on the age range of your students. Obviously, if you're dealing with teenagers, you don't want to give them coloring paper. Right? They're not going to think that's entertaining at all. They're probably going to get mad at you. Um, so you have to, again, going back to that neurodivergent learner thought, it's really important to think, how can I engage every kid in my classroom, regardless of where they are on that spectrum, regardless on if they're behind in school or ahead in school. So because of that, what I generally do is kind of throw a bunch of stuff at them, and then they can pick and choose what they want. So there, I have some listening guides coming around for some of my favorite classes. One is... Uh, the animals and music, there's four separate listening guides for that, and then the Nutcracker was a seasonal class I did, which was super fun and one of my most well-attended classes of all time. Um, and those listening guides are really great for about five through 10. I'll have some older students who also really love those listening guides, some through 12 or even 13, depending on the student. So those are things that, you know, if I have a parent reach out to me and tell me that their student is behind or neurodivergent in some way that requires them to need something to do during class, then I'll offer those materials out if I wouldn't typically offer them. The great part about these specific ones is it keeps the kids engaged, especially if they are kids who otherwise are going to be running around the room and screaming at the top of their lungs because they don't want to do school. Um, when they have a coloring guide, they're sitting there, they're listening, they're completely engaged in class, but they're also getting some movement out, and sometimes they need to do that, if they're, especially if they're unschooled or homeschooled, they're usually used to being able to kind of do things with their own schedule. That's one of the big advantages of homeschooling for most parents and for most students. And so while they like the schedule of being there for an hour, they might not like the schedule that you are currently progressing at. So giving them something like that keeps them completely engaged. They're still involved in class. And also they love showing their pictures at the end of class. Like if you ever have the opportunity to give a kid like a room, a room full of children coloring pages and then let them show those coloring pages, they lose it. They love that. It's one of their favorite things. Um, I also do a lot of worksheets. I have a class, it's an elementary music exploration class. That one is actually a flexible schedule, which I'll get to what exactly that means here in just a minute. Um, but in that class, we learn kind of basic musical listening skills, things like dynamic and tempo, musical beat, rhythm. And then we also learn some different kind of music history things. We learn about the Baroque era, the classical era, and the Romantic era. And in the middle of all of that, we learn the instruments of the orchestra. So for those kids, they get coloring pages that kind of go with things. So they get some coloring pages of like the string family, for example, and then they get to share those with us. They also get worksheets to test their knowledge a little bit. It's still important to remember that we're, we're still teaching, right? We want them to learn something. And so sometimes that means that you have to kind of judge that knowledge. Um, and so that can be done in a lot of different ways. When I'm in a live class, especially, I just like to do group questions with my students and that works really, really well. They love getting to talk to each other. When we're in an entirely online format, um, you can't do that as much because typically, remember, if you have a five-year-old, they're not going to be able to type on the computer by themselves. They might not be able to read by themselves. Mom and dad are probably helping them. So that's something to consider is how can you involve mom and dad if they're going to have to be involved, regardless of the age, really. It just depends on the student. Make sure that when you're doing all of these things, when you're putting these classes together, creating your materials, you know, getting super pumped about your really cool class, Make sure that you also consider that you have to pay yourself, right? 
where none of us are doing this because we entirely just love it so much that we don't want to get paid, and none of us are able to live without paying our bills. So it's important to think of that. It can be really easy to underprice yourself online because it feels like it's not real. It feels like it's not the same as having your students come to your house for a private flute lesson. Um, it, it is. It's very, very different than all of that. But you're still a teacher, and you're still qualified, especially if you have multiple degrees, as some of us do. You know, you need to be pricing yourself so you're getting paid, and paid what you should be paid. So the way that I figure out pricing, out school specifically, recommends $12 an hour per student. Typically, my classes have between four and six students, so pretty decent cash there. But do take in mind, especially at the beginning of all of this, if you're creating the materials, that might, that's time. You're spending time doing that. Mm -hmm. And for some classes, especially like those little handouts that are going around right now for the different animals and music classes, those took a long time to put together. You know, I had to learn how to like use Adobe Illustrator, and I mean, fortunately, my partner's a designer and a photographer and know how to use that stuff already. But still, then I'm taking her time, you know? So just think about that. Just don't forget. Make sure that you're getting paid what you're worth. It's so important, and parents really respect that. I've found when you have a class listed, there are some teachers on out school who will list classes in the beginning for $5 an hour, something like that, very, very low. Um, and they'll run them with only one student. So that's, you're making five bucks an hour when that happens. Parents kind of question that sometimes. They're like, why are you only $5 an hour? Is there a reason? Are you not as qualified as, you th as you're telling me you are? Or are you not as qualified as another parent, or another teacher, rather, another person? Um, so that's something that's important, and it's so easy to not do, I think, especially online. I have the same cost as far as private lessons are concerned. I know some people who actually charge more for private flute lessons or private piano lessons um, than they would do in a live situation because you're having to buy special equipment for that. You know, if you're teaching piano, you might be having to sync your synthesizer, your electronic piano, into your computer. You might have had to buy a mixing software. If you're teaching private flute lessons, you've probably had to upgrade your microphone, and you might have spent a lot of money on the microphone, depending on you know who you are and what quality you want. But just don't forget, just because you're teaching online, it is just as real as teaching in person. You're still taking all of your time and energy to do that, and you are worth as much as you would charge in person and not a cent more. Or it's not a cent less. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a very, very sassy consideration there. Not a cent less than that. Um, also, a thing to think about if you're teaching group classes. Goodbye. If you're teaching group classes specifically, sometimes you'll have families who have several students that are all kind of within that same age range of your group class. For example, I have a five through ten, and sometimes I'll get two or three kids from one family in that class because of you know that's just how children happen sometimes. Um, and so, if that does happen, parents will sometimes reach out to you and ask if there's a multi-learner discount. That's something to consider. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't. Don't. It's pretty simple. I typically do 10% off of the second student. The reality is when you're teaching online, especially in a group class or in a private class, really, theoretically, the kid could be sitting right there. The second student could be sitting right there, you know? And so I think it's really important to, like, respect that a parent is being honest with me and telling me that, you know, Tommy has a little brother who's three who's probably going to be sitting next to him because he's interested in what's going on in class here, and I want to pay for that. And so when they tell me that, I'll give them a little bit off just because it is expensive to teach your students. You know, it is expensive to homeschool your children. You don't get all of the money that you would be getting through a, a public education. You don't get access to all of those things for free. So that's something to consider. If you teach private lessons, you can also consider if you would be willing to teach two sisters at the same time or two brothers at the same time. There are a lot of people who do that, a lot of people who do that, and a lot of people who are very successful that way. Mom and dad like that an hour a week is devoted to music lessons for both kids. It's just easier for them. Yeah, right? Doesn't that sound so great? Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what my favorite classes are and what classes I've found success in, and also just kind of give you some ideas on the types of things you could teach in a group format here. So I, my very favorite class that I teach, and I teach it weekly, is called Musical Meet and Greet, Musicals and Broadway for Teens. So I have kids who are 13 through 18 years old in that one. Um, I teach two sections a week. One section typically has at least six kids in it. The second section usually has between two and three. One the the smaller section is in the evenings, Eastern Standard Time, that's an 8 p.m. Both of those students who are always there and any other ones who come in are generally going to be my public school kids who are just really into Broadway and they want something fun to do, kind of a club environment. They like to meet each other, especially with my teenagers. My other kids are generally um, homeschooled. I do have one who goes to public school like in the mornings and then comes home and you know doesn't, splits it that way. 
This is called an ongoing class. This is an option specifically on OutSchool and also something if you wanted to teach privately through your own studio and give some kind of group classes, this is another option that you would have. The benefits of an ongoing class are that students can drop in and out week to week. They're not committing for an entire month of classes or an entire semester of classes. And it gives the teacher some flexibility as well because you're able to pick your topics like you know, a few days before you have to give the class. So I really love that part because it means if I am inspired, last week we did Sweeney Todd um, and I, you know, somebody mentioned it the week before and I thought, oh, Sweeney Todd, that'd be really fun, let's do that. And so it gives me a lot of flexibility that way as well. Um, the, the kind of downside as a teacher to a class that offers the option for students to drop in and out is you literally don't know who's going to be in that classroom until class starts. Mm -hmm. I had a kid two weeks ago who enrolled two minutes into class and she was there within like, it was like 8.03 she popped into class and I had no idea and I was prepared to just teach my one, my one single student for that week. So that's something to consider is, you know, you have to be super flexible in that type of class environment because otherwise you're not, you know, it's just, you, you can't be thrown off by these things. Because we deal with so many neurodiverse students, being flexible and being ready for them to leave class is another thing that's very different from kind of traditional public school teaching, especially. We can lesson plan all day, and I do. <coughs> I'm a very prepared person usually, and I usually have an outline, and I have, especially if I teach at flexible schedule as well, I've made a video, and I have the video transcript available to me, and just all of these ridiculous things. Um, spend a lot of time doing all of that, but the reality is sometimes my kids want to show me something in the middle of class, and I'm not going to tell them no, because they're excited to talk to other people. Some of them, if they're homeschooled or if they live in remote locations, I have some students who are student or children of expats who are living abroad. They might not have access to other students every day of the week, and they might not have access to other adults every day of the week. And so it's important to be flexible enough that you're still teaching what you need to teach, but that you're still kind of developing a relationship with them and letting them feel like they're the most important person in the room at least once during class. Another class that I love and that I've already sent around for everybody here is My Animals and Music, Musical Exploration. So this is for ages five through 10. I Typically, here in case anybody's not seen them. Oh yeah, awesome, if anybody wants to see them back. Yeah, we had a few people join us a little later. So the handouts there, there's little um, listening guides that I give my kids for each of the pieces. And what we do in that class, typically my classes are between 30 minutes and 50 minutes um, per, per session. That's because past that, your students are gonna like glaze over and not wanna look anymore, especially five-year-olds. Don't make your five-year-olds sit through 90 minutes or more. That would just be absolutely atrocious. Um, and so what we do is I kind of talk them through how to listen to the piece in that one. So we kind of go through and we listen to little clips of things. So for example, I do Carnival of the Animals and we listen to, I think, four movements together. Um, and then as we go through that, we talk about it. We say, you know, does this sound like a lion to you? Why does it sound like a lion? Or the elephant is represented by the string bass. We talk about the string bass. And why did they use the string bass to represent the elephant? And they'll tell you, oh, it's because it's big. Um, and so you kind of talk them through those skills. And you're building those skills with them. And then later, after class, it's their job, or mom and dad's job, to listen to the whole piece. And then the next week, when they come back, you can talk to them more about it. You know, what did you think of Carnival of the Animals? What was your favorite movement? Were there any <laughs> movements you didn't like? They love that question. They love to tell you the ones that they didn't like. Um, we also, through that class, we get to learn about people who are important in music. We get to learn about composers. We get to learn about tone poems. That's an important topic, right? We get to talk a little bit about romantic music. And we get to talk about why romantic music is cool or why people might like romantic music. They get to learn a little bit about the history of pieces. So they're learning so many concepts in such a short amount of time. And then after class, they get to take all of those concepts and they get to use them again. And I think that's what you're wanting to send home with your kids, just like in private lessons. We might work on tone the whole class, but it's not helpful if when my student goes home to practice, they don't remember anything that you talked about with tone, right? So it's building those skills for them to be able to apply later. Um, another class that I am absolutely loving this semester, it's my first semester teaching it, it's probably one of my favorites, is my film music exploration class. This class is so fun. It's nine weeks long, it's for teenagers, 13 through 18, and I do have an eight through 12 section as well with a few kids in it right now. And we are learning about all things film. So we talk about silent movies, we talk about the history of sound effects, we talk about how
silent movies were happening, they usually had an organist in the theater because nobody could fully sound. And we just get to talk about all of these super, super cool things. And some of the things that your students will tell you, especially students who are uh, very, very gifted or who are at the older range of spectrum will just amaze you. I had a kid, we just learned about Danny Elfman last week. Um, and he told me so many things about Danny Elfman that I didn't even know in his responses to me. And then I looked him up because I was like, this is true, I'm gonna tell everybody else. And they are all true, you know, because they're so fascinated by these topics that they've already done all of this research and watched all the videos on YouTube and they're super involved and it's so cool to get to see your students kind of just run with the topic, you know. And it's I think what's so exciting about online learning, especially in online education and why I'm such a big proponent of it, is you can teach anything. You can teach any topic to your kids. And it doesn't matter what you're teaching as long as they're learning. You know, we want everyone to be a lifelong learner. I want to be a lifelong learner, and I want my kids to be lifelong learners. And if they have a really awesome experience in your class, whether that's private lessons or a group class on musicals or whatever, that's going to encourage them to keep checking into that themselves. You're just inspiring them to keep going. That class, specifically film music exploration, is also an example of a flexible schedule class. So I have mentioned that a little bit at the beginning, but I want to kind of explain what that means because that's important. Flexible Schedule is a class that is entirely based online, meaning there are no live meetings. So you never log into Zoom and talk to them one-on-one -on -one or live. They're kind of um, a double-edged sword. I love Flexible Schedule because I have chronic illnesses and have doctor's appointments and I have treatments at the hospital and all of these things that kind of overrun my life sometimes. And it's nice to be able to take my work anywhere and not feel like I have to be in a quiet environment where I can teach, which I typically do. I want my students to have you know, a nice experience in class. And it's not a nice experience if they can hear my IV pump behind me. That's not fun for anybody. Um, so that's one of the perks of Flex Schedule for sure. A lot of older students love Flexible Schedule because they don't have to have that awkward interaction with each other on the computer. <laughs> Some of my kids think it's really awkward. I had a class once, there were three boys, and I think it was my sound effects class, um, and we were like, no, it was John Williams, and we were just pushing on through and having a great time, and I just thought, these kids are really quiet. You know, they just don't, hardly want to talk and two of them were brothers I was like, that's really odd that they won't they won't talk or whatever and then after class I typically send kind of a report to the parents just a feedback especially if they have a kid who's done something outstanding and so I have one student who used the chat box in zoom to talk which some of them do because he wasn't comfortable unmuting himself so I sent a note to mom and said you know I really enjoyed how so and so um, used the chat box to communicate today and that he was still able to kind of overcome his shyness <coughs> and find a way to communicate with me that he was comfortable with. You know, that's something we're really trying to teach in all instances of education. And she emailed me back and she said, it's really weird actually, you know, because the three of them are best friends and I don't know why they wouldn't <laughs> talk to each other. And these were best friends in this class and they still didn't want to talk to each other. So that's a thing to consider as well. Sometimes they don't talk and you think it's because they're all shy, but they're not. They're just teenage boys. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was that was a good one. The other kind of, or I guess the big disadvantage all in all the flexible schedule is that it does take more time up front for you. You have to develop those materials. In my case, I always do video lessons, so I sit down and record them. I use a program called Toonly a lot. So Toonly gives you the ability to make like a little animated character who's like talking on screen. That means I don't have to feel like pretty I don't have to, you know, put on nice clothes or anything to record those videos, which is an advantage for me because sometimes I just don't want to. Um, and the other advantage for that is, especially with my little kids, the animation thing works really well for them. It's the reason why cartoons work for children. So it keeps them engaged a little bit more than it might otherwise. Um, so that's something to consider. The program's Toonly. There's also another one called Doodly, D-O-O-D-L-Y, <laughs> which is like doodles that they make on screen. So those are two programs. Otherwise. Things like iMovie and you can do a slideshow. Some teachers just log into their own Zoom account and record a video lecture and then they post that. That <coughs> works for some students and for some teachers. I kind of feel like it's not as interactive as I would want it to be for my flexible schedule students especially. <coughs> a lot of flex schedule kids have some kind of neurodiversity going on. They might not feel comfortable interacting in the classroom um, with other students or with the teacher or whatever. <coughs> so it's important to think about that. And the same vein with flexible schedule, when I do my videos, I always provide a video transcript for my students because you do not know who's hard of hearing or who might need to be able to read that video transcript to understand entirely what you're saying to them. Um, so I always give them a handout. I pass one around for my film music class. Um, they get a handout with a summary of what we are covering in that <laughs> class. They get a list of resources that they can check out on their own or things that I use to develop the class because I don't want anyone to think I'm plagiarizing anything. So I give them all of their resources. 
Um, and then I give the video transcript, the comprehension questions that they answer typically weekly. Some of them are never going to answer the questions in a million years, but usually they'll at least communicate a little bit with me in the classroom, which is exciting for me. And then I also find additional videos on YouTube. So like my sound effects class, for example, there are a lot of videos of um, Foley artists working. And so I'll give them some videos that they can watch and I'll give them maybe three or four examples and say pick one and you can watch that as well. Throw that all into a YouTube playlist and then I can just give them the link to the playlist and they can literally sit in front of the computer and just watch straight through that playlist if they want. So that's flexible schedule. And then the other kind of class I wanted to mention was the Nutcracker class, which I already sent around that handout. So a lot of classes, especially when you're a new teacher, it's really beneficial to offer one-time classes or single classes. So these are classes that cover a single concept or a single topic that can be covered in you know between 30 to 50 minutes typically. Parents love these because they wanna be able to test run the teacher. They wanna make sure that you're going to work with their student and that whatever you're providing is you know at the level that they expect before they invest a huge amount of money into like a nine week class, for example. My nine week class for students I think is about $120. So parents don't want to give you 120 bucks if they're not sure if their kid's going to like you or whatever. And it's not necessarily even that they're like interviewing you, it's just the reality is some students are going to get along better with other teachers, just like private school, it's the exact same thing. So offering those one-time classes on single topics that you just love teaching are super, super important. So how do you even find these students if you're not teaching in a platform like OutSchool, or even if you are teaching on a platform like OutSchool. So marketing is probably the biggest challenge and the most important part of teaching online. So first things first, know your audience. If you have a private flute studio and you're hoping to kind of send some of your students into digital land, maybe it works better for their schedule or they live far away or whatever, that's great. You have your audience already. It's completely done. You've wrapped it up, put a bow on it, it's great. If you don't have that, think about the people who are going to be using your classes. So typically there's going to be homeschoolers or unschoolers because otherwise they're probably going to be getting some kind of music education available to them in school, in public or private school. Usually these families especially don't necessarily just want someone who's an amazing public school teacher. They admire it if you taught public school for years and years and you talk about that, but they want someone who has experiences. They want their kids to be coming to you for a reason. They want to know what you're passionate about and what you like. So for example, when I teach my, um, I have my film music class has a class on studio musicians. And I talk about how, you know, I loved being in, um, you know, when we would go to like this film festival and I would play in the film festival and how exciting it was to get to see how all of those parts came together. Or my musical class, I talk about working in a pit. So those types of experience are things that parents really admire and they really look forward to. And it's also an instant connection for you with your student. So talking about those things and thinking about how your own experiences can relate to whatever topics you want to teach. If you're teaching privately, talk about your experience as a private flute student. Talk about the things that you really admire in your teachers. And you can even talk about your struggles. Maybe you had a teacher who made you not feel very good about yourself. You can talk about those things. It's important. They want you to be a real person. They don't want you just to be, you know, the teacher god up on a pedestal because we're not. We all have our things, right? It's also good to highlight what makes you special or unique, especially if you are not using a platform and maybe you're just posting to your website about these group classes and trying to get running that way. You really need to sell what makes you unique. Outside of that, it's good to use social media. We all hate social media, but it's so important right now. So using Facebook or Instagram to kind of show what you're doing in your classroom, that's what I typically do. Parents love that. They love hearing what we're talking about and then seeing like a YouTube video that goes with it. And like, this is what I'm showing this week in my film music class or things like that. You can also join Facebook groups and use them to share class links. If you have friends or if you yourself are in a homeschool community, this is awesome for you. You've already kind of got some built-in connections that way. Um, homeschoolers love to hear about what else they can be doing to supplement their children's education. That's probably why they're homeschooling them, right? They want to give them a better experience than they could have in public school. So because of that, it's really great to use these communities to just interact with the parents and let them kind of get to know you, so to speak, and also just to kind of show them what you're offering and kind of explain who you are and let them come to you. They will eventually, no matter what, they're going to eventually find you. Another example or another thing to do would be a website. I have a website. It's a great place to show what, who I am and what I'm doing and what types of things I like. You know, just sharing those types of things. Blogs are really successful for some teachers. That one just depends on who you are. I could never keep up with the blog. Um, but if I could keep up with the blog, it would be a great way to market. Oh, what time is it? So let's 
talk about some of these challenges, right? There are a lot of challenges to teaching online, especially if it is your full-time gig, as it is with me, because while working from home sounds awesome, it is so hard, and it makes a big, it's a big adjustment. It was really hard for me in the beginning of teaching online to get used to things, because I felt so lonely in my house all day with just like my animals around, who are great, but not the same as having a person or colleagues to talk to. It's also hard to feel motivated when you're not surrounded by colleagues who are kind of constantly you know, sharing ideas and giving you inspiration and talking about what they're doing in their classrooms and all of those things. So the biggest way to find motivation, at least for me, well, it's twofold. One, I think about what I, if I were a parent, what kind of teacher I would want for my students, what kind of person I would want to be talking to my kids on a regular basis, and that keeps me going, right? That makes me want to be better and want to learn more and want to be educated and all of these things because I want to be the best teacher I could be. That's why I'm there, and that's probably anybody else who teaches. That's why you're there as well, and probably part of why you came to this presentation today. As far as feeling lonely, I turned to the internet, which makes sense. I teach online. Um, so there are so many groups for teachers who teach online, for digital educators, we call ourselves traditionally. Um, and some of those groups are linked in with the platforms I use, so things like OutSchool or even my ESL teaching um, program. There are, there's a platform there as well. And you just have to kind of be willing to put yourself out there a little bit online, I think is the hardest part. I'm one of those people that never post anything about myself on like my personal Facebook page. And like I was terribly sick and in and out of the hospital and nobody knew because I didn't put it on Facebook. Um, and so you just have to be willing to kind of share about yourself and realize that everyone you're talking to probably feels the same way. And it's really awesome to have the ability to take like the inspiration in these groups back to your classroom as well. And it kind of keeps you from feeling like you're just sitting alone like in your house all day, which it's really easy to do that. Another big struggle of working from home in any profession is differentiating between your home time and your work time. And anybody who ever brings their work home with them it knows entirely what I'm talking about. When your office is in your house, it's so easy to go up there and just get like pulled away, especially if you feel like you have a big project or you have something you really need to do. And of course, we're all going to have to do that at some point in our lives, right? Sometimes they just, things don't fall between nine and five. Um, but it's really important to kind of set a schedule for yourself and try to stick to your schedule. It's hard to do, but it's so, so important to know that after 5 p.m. or after dinner <laughs> or whatever it is for you, I'm not going back to my office until tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. when I'm teaching my ESL kids or whatever it is for you. Um, also, another big one is adapting to from the live teaching experience into this online teaching experience and specifically dealing with neurodivergent learners in this situation. In a classroom, generally, you're going to know any, any issues that your students are having. You're going to have been involved in their IEP. You're going to have some good ideas about all of that. You're not necessarily going to have that in an online classroom. So you have to be so flexible and just willing to go with it. If your student wants to get up and show you their chickens, I had a student one time who wanted to show me his chickens, then you just go with it, you just go with it. And it's a big lesson in patience and a big lesson in empathy and a big lesson in flexibility. You just have to be so willing to just do all of these things. I'm gonna give you one last <laughs> challenge before I kind of wrap things up here. Taxes, big, big issue, right? If you're getting paid through PayPal, you still have to pay taxes and all of those things. So you are technically, in this situation, an independent contractor if you're working with the platform, or you are self-employed if you're working for yourself. Same way as dealing with your private studio taxes, you're going to have to pay taxes to the US government. So generally, it's gonna fall between 20 to 30%, depends on who you are and kind of what other deductions you're taking in your particular tax situation. But that's something to keep in mind when you start getting that money in and thinking like, I'm doing so great. Make sure you put some away for tax season so you're not like dying at the end. And also consider if you're someone who doesn't like dealing with taxes, who doesn't want to think about your deductions and what qualifies and what doesn't, hire somebody. Don't hurt yourself. And don't get yourself into trouble because you're just trying to be stubborn and not hire somebody. Most of us are not accountants or tax specialty specialists, so just go ahead and do that. I want to share just two quick stories, and then I'm going to give time for questions if anybody has them. <coughs> but I want to tell you a little bit about some of my kids because that's why I'm here because I love teaching them. <coughs> so I had a student, I'm not going to give you his name, but we'll call him B. And B was in my EDM and DJing class. So I have a class where we spent four weeks learning about electronic <laughs> dance music and the history of DJs. And these kids are my best kids because they're hilarious. They love disco, and they love dancing, and they love like dead mouse, and like all of these things that you just would never imagine that like an eight-year-old would love. They're super into it, and they're so excited because they get to take class in school on a subject that they are so passionate about. So I had this kid be, 
we were teaching our very, I was, our very first class together, and we got towards the end of it. And at the end of class, we were going to talk a little bit about, um, what were we even talking about? Dubstep, probably. Um, but we were talking about different genres of EDM, and we were going to watch a video of Marshmallow. Marshmallow is alone, I think. And we only watch a few, probably 20 or 30 seconds of these things. Anyway, so I'm sitting there teaching, and I'm in a classroom with two students for this one. And my other kid was super quiet, H, we'll call him H. H was a very quiet, kind of relaxed student, kind of laid back. And then B had the entire class been so enthusiastic, so excited, wanted to tell me all these things. I was like, this is great, buddy, this is great, we're having fun. Um, and so then we start watching the marshmallow video, and on Zoom, at least, your students are in these little boxes, like probably this big, and they're kind of up in the corner. And so when we're watching a video together in class, I generally don't like stare at them, because that feels uncomfortable, like I'm like invading their personal space or something. So I'm watching the video, and then I look up into B's box there, and B is in a marshmallow costume, a full <laughs> costume. Uh, he had that head, and the head had eyes that lit up, and anyone who doesn't know marshmallow, it's a giant marshmallow, literally. Um, and he's just in the costume, and he brought the costume to class. And that was our first class together, and he continued to bring costumes. To he looked ahead in the handouts and saw who we were talking about and would bring the corresponding costume. So that's one of my favorite moments um, with that particular student. And another one is I have a class, it's an ongoing class, so that's the one where the students can drop in and out as they kind of want to, um, called Coloring with Composers. This is a hugely successful class. We meet for half an hour every week. We learn about one single composer. They get a coloring page to color during class, and at the end of class, they get to show their, their picture off. And of course, as we're learning and listening, we're learning all sorts of other musical skills, too. But I'm not selling that to them because they're like five years old. They don't care. But they're learning about things like timbre and color and... Um, you know, dynamics and tempo, and they're learning all of those musical listening skills that I'm trying to bring out in them, but in this really fun environment. So in that class, I have a student who I've now taught for probably, she's probably been in that class for about 12 weeks, probably about 12 sessions, split up between last semester and this semester. She lives on a boat, of all things, in Annapolis, in the harbor. Um, and so she's been bouncing around in class for a while, right? And we, I don't even remember who we were listening to, but we were listening to somebody, and the piece finished up, and I said, now what did everybody think of that? Did you like it? Did you notice anything? Was there anything special? What instruments did you hear? You know, give me your reaction in two seconds or less, or however long it was. Um, and so she raised her hand, as she always does, and I called on her, and I said, what do you have to say? And we'll call her N. And she said, it sounded just like Peter and the Wolf. It sounded like Prokofiev. I said, that's it. That's why I'm doing this. It's so you can draw those connections all by yourself. It's amazing what the kids can like pick up and what connections they can draw, and students who aren't in a band program at school or who aren't in elementary music. And after just 12 weeks of learning for half an hour a week, they're able to kind of just push all of these things together. And it's amazing. And that's why I teach online. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. How would you share listening <coughs> examples um, in any of your online class? Like, do you do it through Google Drive? Or is, does like the platform like think it so you're both listening at the same time yeah or? so for out school particularly we use zoom for our platform and I can share my screen and also share my audio so oh, I'll okay. embed my like YouTube video for example into a Google PowerPoint whatever they Google slides I guess is what they call them <laughs> um, and then I'll screen share that and then we can all watch that together the thing to be careful with the biggest thing to be careful with <laughs> is that is that if it's not into not um, out of copyright or whatever if it's something new you don't want to share more than 30 seconds of it because technically that's illegal um, because whoever owns that video isn't getting the views, they're not getting the, the money, um, the monetization from that. So that's something to definitely keep in mind too, because that's kind of like a big issue in the online world, is just how much sharing is too much sharing. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? Yeah? What is your like um, overhead for, not the, uh, excluding the equipment, like for like uh, the platforms? So OutSchool doesn't charge anything. To list classes on there, they do take 30% of your income. So I get 30% of my class fees or whatever go to them. I still end up making typically between 30 and $40 an hour for an hour class. Um, of course, I've put materials into that and everything to figuring all of that stuff out. But the overhead is actually incredibly small for teaching online, especially once you have materials and all of that stuff. That's probably your biggest cost, is just getting set up to teach online and getting equipment and that type of stuff. Anything else? This is the part in class where I would say we all love staring at each other. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to go ahead and end so the next person can get set up in here. But thank you all so much for coming and enjoy the rest of your time. Thank you.